that we are a team and by virtue of modeling a winning team then the overall effect the gestalt if you will of the experience of the winning summit is that everyone who consumes it has been presented with a cohesive winning team Napoleon Hill's book, uh, the, S the Laws of Success in 16 Lessons, which was written in 1925 and was also later banned. <laughs> it was a banned book because Napoleon Hill shared the unadulterated uh, experiences and secret sauce of all the major successful people of his age, and they did not want their secrets told. The Henry Fords, uh, Carnegie Mellons, the, you know, all of these great industrialists, leaders of nations, army generals, blah, 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 didn't want their secrets told, but he did it anyway. And so his first law is the law of the mastermind. So if we, as a group of speakers, can create more of a mastermind experience, whereas we all share in one large dynamic goal that collectively we want to advance someone's life to a completely new place. Our, we each have our avatar, so to speak, our person that we're trying to reach. And if we each reach that person successfully, but then we can all reach different aspects of that person and that person and that person and then have this collective wow experience where we actually put people into overwhelm for a short period of time so they can have a quantum change in their mindset and i know everybody's following this and to see you writing is like blowing my mind stop taking notes anyway <laughs> so what does that look like so this is this is my question to you how do we operate in a mastermind to create as many as many possible connections as we can who wants to who wants to talk on that um, so i think that a key point that uh had me start writing that you said okay so we are trying to reach our people um, well, one of the things that is really embedded in reaching people is you have to know who your person is they basically kind of fall into four quadrants high skill high confidence low skill uh low confidence and then you know high and low and high and lo low and high right confidence and skills so you have to figure out what are your person's assets what are their challenges and obstacles and you have to teach to the audience that you have because terry also mentioned that his particular expertise or drive or interest is in dealing with engineers and scientists who are you know n notoriously and mostly because of their brain wiring highly introverted people who have this rich interior life but who have a really hard time stepping out of that to embrace so much of what is uh, germane to operating on a winning plan. That's my, that's my take. Awesome. And I want to piggyback on that because I think what you just said was an amazing beginning because wow. there's so many different ways we can go right now. My background is largely in psychology, but it's also heavily in spirituality and brain science. And um, my, my last name is Patton, so I have to be a strategist, okay? <laughs> but in psychology, in psychological testing, there are two main things that are very, very important, relevancy and validity. So absolutely, we want to be relevant because if we're not relevant, then it's meaningless. Also, we want to be valid because if it's not valid, it's not true. But then here's the funny thing, right? There's the difference between perception and reality and where sometimes things that are relevant and valid 
are not useful to the person because they don't perceive that they need it. Yeah, I work a lot with energy, which is kind of a, 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 an odd thing coming from a guy that comes from the corporate business world and Ivy League school uh, education and things like that. Uh, but I actually already used this intuitively when I was in high levels of business. Um, you know, when I was at GE Capital, I always, um, you know, I was pretty good sales. And, and the reason was everybody has a frequency, a frequency of, of receptivity. And when we can dial into someone's frequency, they will hear us. If we do not dial into their frequency, we talk from ourselves, right? We're just talking into space, but it's not really receiving. And so, you know, we're at FM and someone else is on AM. So one of the things of connecting with people, whenever we're in a discussion, this could be in personal relationships, this can be in business settings, this can be an audience of a thousand people, is really feeling that energy, that frequency that they're at. Now there's a second layer to this, that we all have an energetic footprint, a, a fingerprint, a DNA type of thing. And our clients, the people that we are meant to serve here, will always find us with this, they will connect with us energetically. The way we talk, it's not it, it's not just the words we use, it's our energy that we're channeling through us. And so there's an energetic play here. Now, building on Margaret's theme, there are words that we need to use because our audience lives in a certain vocabulary. And so if we speak, you know, when I work with CEOs, um, you know, I can throw a whole bunch of beautiful spiritual words in there and they won't hear it because they're not familiar with it. it. doesn't mean anything to them, right? So I don't talk much about energy or chakras. I talk about power because in the world of a CEO, power is something he resonates with. It's like he, he is playing a power game, especially if he's an alpha. And so, you know, we can translate our words. Now, the third part I wanted to just layer in there is that usually our ideal client, the one that will resonate the most with us, um, is, you know, we can usually look back at ourselves, you know, a few years back, 10 years back, five years back, our journey. And we are usually our own best client just a few years back because we have walked that path where they are right now. And when we describe our journey and we make that personal, we can draw them into that story, right? People resonate with stories. Humanity has always evolved around stories, storytelling. And as, although I think a really big part of getting your message across is really telling your story. And those people that need to hear it, right? Those people that are in your orbit, that are your tribe, they are gonna energetically connect with that story. They're gonna recognize themselves in it. And usually it's yourself, you know, in your own trajectory. And usually as teachers, we are just a few steps ahead of them. And this is a circular path, you know, nobody's really ahead of anybody. Um, this isn't about being better or, or, or because we're all at different stages, uh, but it's more that those people that are here to be guided by us, um, you know, they're going to resonate with our story, with our path. And then we layer in those words that maybe we were, we would resonate with three years, five years, 10 years ago. And that that's, I think, how you can find those ideal clients that are really, you know, right now here for you to serve. That's amazing. And so I want to also say one other very short thing. And then I think Terry's going to talk next after this. Albert Einstein said the simplest solution is usually the best, but not simpler. Because five twelfths is sort of like one third, but not quite. Or it's, like, it's almost like one, yeah. one fourth, but not quite. Yeah. Being able to boil things down into this simplest, most digestible understanding of the client, the learner, is absolutely essential. Terry, am I putting you on the spot? Yes, you are, but uh, that's how that's how <laughs> champions are made, I guess. A diamond is uh, a piece of coal under pressure. Uh, I like the Einstein quote, um, and in fact, I'll probably go get a haircut pretty soon, but since the pandemic, I have not uh, cut it at all. Uh, I got to a point where people referred to me as Einstein, and I really like that. But now people say it looks like you uh, got kicked out of a homeless shelter. So maybe there's a point at which I need to, to trim it. Uh, the comments Robert was making about uh, tapping into their energy uh, really, I think, begins with rapport. Um, you can model physiologically. You, know, you can ask questions. One of my best techniques for really getting in, in touch with a person is to basically find out, find out what's important to them. And absolutely, once you enter their world 
and have rapport and connection, you can guide them in, in directions that uh, they, they desire to be, but perhaps don't realize. Um, I got my training from uh, Tony Robbins, uh, primarily. I read his first book in 1986, attended a workshop and said, hey, this is pretty cool stuff. So I went back, became certified, became a trainer for him, his master trainer, and then uh, his first strategic planner. So I have learned to integrate, you know, body, mind, spirit, and those are simple techniques. Well, I won't say they're simple techniques. It takes a lifetime to really get there. But if you ask the right questions, uh, you can you can peel open a person's curiosity and they discover deeper dimensions. Uh, somebody mentioned that uh, technical people are mostly, you know, they have a, a rich interior life. I like that expression. Um, but not so much emotionally or spiritually. But once you start getting them curious and give them the tools, wow, they're fascinated by it. So I think that's part of our job to, to ask the kind of questions that open people up in a way that they had not realized is possible. Another quick thing to say. So I've decided that I'm going to have sound bites and that I'm going to let you all speak in an extended way. Like, because simple doesn't mean easy. Like, here's a really simple phrase. Run to danger. It's very simple. Not easy. Uh, Conrad is new on the call. For Conrad's sake, what we're doing is we're sort of masterminding our talk so that we can create as many connections together so that we can understand each other so that in our presentations then we're making as many connections as we can to deepen the impact with the ultimate consumers of this so that they can get more of a wow factor more of an overwhelm more greater ability to synthesize the understanding of all these concepts and how they work together. So um, who wants to go next, Conrad or Hernan? Yeah. Conrad, I basically said key to any student, any athlete, any person um, receiving the lesson, receiving the session, the coaching is that you have the coach, the teacher, you have to know who your person is really from the inside out. What is their brain map? How do they interact with information? Uh, what kind of skill sets do they already possess? Um, and to Terry's point, how is it that you get them to be curious about what they don't know so that they can point their own assets toward learning the things um, that they don't yet have at a mastery level? I'm very fortunate, guys, in that I get to work with a lot of extremely good athletes. And at the same time, the reason I feel so fortunate is I'm also working with a lot of potentially very good athletes that are really young. And so I think what's key is we talked about this a little bit this morning in the clubhouse, but it's how do you shape those young athletes or older athletes to be coachable and receive information? I'm going to go back to what I believe to be absolutely critical. And I could be wrong. I'm sure there are examples where I am wrong. But if you look at the players <clears throat> that have had the same coaches for long periods of time, the same sort of um, environment or similar environment, uh, the parents are on board with what's going on. It's so much easier to work with that player because your message and your objectives can become more articulate and a little more complicated or complex as they get older. But as long as you've got the same pillars in place and you're developing the foundation, the personality of that player over a long period of time, I feel like the message can get through. One of the things that happens a lot, and it's one of my, you know, I get parents, I just got off the phone 10 minutes ago with a parent who, the kid has risen two points uh, on a UTR in the past 12 months. He's doing amazing. But the mum changes academy because she couldn't get the same private coach that she had for the next two weeks. So I've just said to her, do you understand what you're doing to your son? You are completely shaking his earth. You are completely moot. The pillars are not the same. The guy, wherever you're going next, I don't know that person. I, I have no influence on that person. And there's nothing I can do to help your a transition and b consolidation and comfort so that he's ready to learn and so that's something i talk a lot about is you know there's a reason the hingises and the williamses and the, the names roll on the tms and then now the fernandezes and 
you can just keep going. It's not that the parents are necessarily the coaches. It's the consistency of the pillars around that player. And so we all know at the end of the day, and, and sadly, on some level, we're also in the service industry. And so the first thing that happens, a kid goes to a new academy, that coach needs to make an impact. So what do they do? They tinker with the serve or they, they you know, go from a full swing to a half. Immediately you've changed that kid's whole belief system, his structure in what he's doing. And so, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure if I'm exactly on track, but it's really about, for me, the foundation, the pillars around them, helps to create perspective, shaping that individual's, you know, ideas and belief and, and, and you know, goal-orientated development in a very structured way. We need, it. we need the same player for years to be able to make them into players. And one last thing I'd, I'll mention is, you know, as I'm, as I'm talking to you, I'm thinking about a couple of players that we have that are doing extremely well right now. I mean, you know, the Wimbledon junior winner this year, Samir Banerjee, has been in our program since he was nine years old. I've worked with him, you know, regularly over the past five years, four and a half years. And I can tell you the number of times that I need to speak to his parents to have them reiterate the coaching message in a non-coaching way. And the parents are totally on board. The other side of this is the what I call exposure, protection, and re-exposure rule. So when do we need to expose that kid to more stress? When do we need to protect them from stress? Now, if I'm exposing a kid to stress when they're not in a good moment or they're upping an age group or you know it's a challenging season coming, I know that's not going to help them develop their, you know, their unwavering self-belief. So the parents have to be on board with that. And for them to believe my message, it's a relationship. And, you know, Mark can tell you how often I talk about culture, relationship, um, all of that requires timing. And so I go back to the whole pillars, foundations. That's the only way you're ever going to get the kids to really listen. So just first of all, I want everybody in the room to realize that they're in the company of giants and experts in their niches, okay, because you all are. Um, the next two to go in, in any order, would be Hernan, from the per parent sector, used to be on the tour uh, and had his 15-year-old talented tennis player boy drop out. So I'd like Hernan to speak about parent and what. Conrad was talking about, and Margaret, bless her soul, that is speaking about transitioning as an action verb on the winning <clears throat> summit. Uh, because I share my story in my two, in my two presentations. And um, as you say, Mark, I'm a former tennis player and have a son that quit at 15 years old, and he was really good. And at that moment, I realized that I have to change to with the relationship and I have to evolve as a person and that's that's what I I try to teach to the to the parents now they have to take care of themselves instead of take care of the kids just to the kid be, they become the best version of themselves and what Conrad said uh, at the very beginning he said that new coaches train the kids in new aspects and that's what happened to my kid because he was so good and every coach that touches him want to change in something and that was very stressful so you have to be very careful about how you you deal with a kid that is evolving and growing i can't i can't contain myself in my seat because that alpha nature of mine is just has me <laughs> respond and introduce myself to conrad because while he may have used slightly different words than i do i have been in the health fitness performance industry now for a decade and many of my clients have been engaged with me for seven plus years. So embedded in that concept are several of the words that Conrad used, which are continuity, uh, relationship, and my word transitioning that I will speak on um, at the summit the heart and soul of it is that same exposure, protection, re-exposure rule. Because transitioning from one place to the next, to the next, you know, wrapping with it this notion of shifting paradigms with the objective that they land the person 
at a higher level, at a, at a winning level. I mean, this actually embodies the respect for the biological nature of human beings. We are dynamic creatures. And so there is a real art and science to being able to do that with human beings. So Conrad, I love your style already. <laughs> Margaret, I, awesome. no, I appreciate that. And I wanted to just lay a one thought in. Uh, look, again, I like it. How careful are we with what we allow our children to watch on TV? Let's think about that for a second. So careful about the language, what they see on a screen. Is it age appropriate? Is it not? I would argue the question that when they're playing a match and they go through a horrible experience, because they all have a horrible experience, do we go through that reflective and analytical are we assessing and then are we clearing? So are we going through that process after every experience they have? Now, again, you won't be able to do that effectively unless you have a relationship with that player. They are not going to tell you what they need to tell you unless you have a long-standing, proven relationship with them. What does that take? That takes experiences. And so who has that better than anyone but mom and dad? And so yeah. you've got to get that on board with the parents. You've got to drop that screen of, you know, I'm worried about the parent. Am I doing the right thing? Am I not doing the right thing? If you're doing the honest thing and you're doing the right thing, then that's usually the best thing to do. And what happens is I feel players recognize that. I'm going to go back again to the, the boy who won Wimbledon, right? So the first day that... I would say probably the second day I was on court with him, um, it was a very interesting story because by by very nature, the kid is so competitive. At this time, he was 13. Uh, he just won his second goal ball here in the US, which is a pretty big thing for him. Um, and the, we, he was on court with another boy who was the number one player at Yale. Okay, now this kid was a 13 plus UTR. So there is no way that the young fellow is going to take the old but fellow. He came out and they were starting to engage in a bit of a verbal. And I said, look, guys, there's only one way to sort this. You're going to go out on court four at the end there and you guys are going to play a set. But you know what? The old guy, I mean, you only got one served. And the young guy, you go for it. And of course, they got competitive and it got a little bit heady. In the end, what, what we all knew would happen, happened. The 13 plus absolutely crunched uh, our Wimbledon champion. The guy picked up his bag, stormed out for the day, didn't say goodbye to anyone. He was really not happy. I picked up the phone, I called the dad and I said, look, this is me reaching out as a human. It wasn't, it, you know, it wasn't a great day. I'm sure he's furious. I'm sure he's at home. Just so you expect it. But I got to tell you that I really don't agree with what he did. I thought it was totally inappropriate that he picked up his bag. He walked out. You know, he, you got to learn to accept the feet. And let's be honest. Yep. We all knew he was going to get pummeled. He didn't. And I don't want to take the mist off the mountain. But we need to develop those humanistic skills of, Someone's slightly better than me. Thank you very much. See you next time. Um, okay. The parents protected him and and, and appreciated that. And later on, uh, we saw that individual change his way uh, through many experiences. And how humble he is now, I really feel like it started back then. Okay, terrific. That's great. And I think that's a, I think that's really a great thing because what a, a lot of the power and what we're going to do is the power of story, right? But now we're starting to get into the weeds. So let's come back up. Let's fly back up at 30,000 feet and go back to the meta communication of what we're trying to do. So in this time, we really want to accomplish more is understanding kind of the overall of each other's talks so that we can find connection points rather than starting to give our talks now. You know, when I'm speaking about the brain, I'm going to be talking about five fundamental things that, that you need to do in order to take good care of your brain. And more and more, the understanding of the importance of sleep is amazing. Sleep is maybe the number one and most important thing you have to do. So I'm going to be going into sleep, hydration, 
nutrition, um, you know, working, doing things to get into your brain plasticity. And then with the collaboration piece, it's going to be about, it's going to be the five myths of working together because there are these myths that people operate on. One of the myths is the divine right of royalty. And another one is the myth of right thinking. And then there's the myth of 24 7, 365. Then there's the myth of majority rules. So, so these are really important myths that people walk alongside. And my quick story, and I'll just tell you in a very thumbnail, the schedule said we were supposed to have a hard workout. I looked at my team, I saw some tired kids, went to my team captain, I said, do you think we should do a hard workout? He's super fit. He said, yeah, sure, coach, bring it. My other team captain is very a people pleaser. So he's like, sure, coach, whatever you want to do. Third captain says, I don't know, I'm kind of tired. And there are about five or six guys that are tired too. Right? So, so I brought them together. I said, here, let's talk about it and then we'll vote. How did the vote come out? It was two to one for a hard workout. So I said, here guys, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take it easy today and you're gonna learn something about leadership because majority doesn't rule. My schedule doesn't rule. I, the leader of this team, don't rule. What rules is the concern for these people that we could lose if we push them over the edge. So that's the gist of my collaborative talk. So. Vincent, are you ready to come on and, and talk a, a little bit about the, you know, the overview of your talk? Oh, not yet. I just, I'm just listening. I want to learn. Okay. But we, well, yes, we want you to learn, but we want to learn you because we want to be able to make connections with how we present to what you're doing. So who has something more to add on this? And it looks like we're about 12 minutes from from wrapping up, it, does anybody feel like we need to go longer? I'd love Robert to talk for a minute or so about humanity. You know, make it really succinct because I can talk about this stuff for, for days on end. And, um, you know, and, and this came from a discussion with Mark. Um, where we're really talking about the influence of technology um, and, and, you know, how we're pushing the edge on that uh, science, technology, you know, really the church of science, I call it, right? We just obsessed with all those things. and. You know, when I think about humanity, there's one core need that we have as human beings. And when I work with my clients, uh, I can almost relate anything in their lives back to this. Uh, I used to play competitive tennis. I can relate it back. I was a coach as well. And so we have this one human need, and that's to be seen, heard, and loved. And that's a really deep core belief. And when we can engage with someone, it could be a, a pupil that we're coaching, could be a CEO we're working with, could be an audience. When we can make people seen, heard, and loved, you know, we touch their humanity, we touch their heart, and we can have an entirely different conversation. Uh, and we can reach them in ways that in this technology, science obsessed, where everything is mechanical, where everything is, you know, a process, everything is statistics. You know, we are not a statistic as a human being. You know, we, we, we have a heart and there's actually an enormous amount of higher wisdom in our heart. Uh, it's actually a center of intelligence that we can activate. Uh, but everything comes down that is seen, heard and loved. And that comes from a very core belief that, you know, we get into this world and we got all this upbringing and societal beliefs and maybe religious dogma. And we have all this conditioned thinking that gets layered into our mind. And a lot of that and what drives a lot of us is that we want to be enough. We want to be seen, heard, and loved. And so when we can reach people on that level, um, you know, we can have an enormous amount of impact on the messages that we bring, the teaching, the coaching that we bring. And then what I want to tie in with what Conrad was saying, you know, what I talk a lot about with CEOs and, and, and high level people is reframing their relationship with failure. In our society, and especially in a game like tennis, where it's a binary, right? There's a winner and a loser. And there's this concept of being humble in, um, in, in victory and, uh, and graceful in defeat. But when we can reframe failure and say there is no such thing as failure, we either win or we learn something. Now, we can take an enormous amount of pressure out of our system, which really actually lives in our nervous system. 
Because when our nervous system is hypersensitive, you know, this is when we get tense. This is where, you know, you can see it on the court, right? When, when, a, when a player gets tense, his breathing gets shallow, he goes into symptomatic and a part of his nervous system. And then you can see this in every part of life. You can see that the CEOs that have crucial decisions. You see this with politicians that are on the spot that are, you know, with enormous amount of pressure. And so uh, all of this comes back to this relationship we have with failure. And when we can reframe failure as it's, it, it just doesn't exist, that's a mental concept. In the world of spirituality, there's no such thing as failure, they just experience it. And when we can reframe that, we really kind of open up. And so that experience with Conrad was describing is, you know, you get a crushing defeat and, you know, he's all sad about it. We can reframe that experience and say, well, you know, there is no such thing as failure. Yeah, you lost this game, this set, but what did you learn? Well, everything becomes a winning experience at that point when we can reframe like that. That's awesome. I have nothing to add. Does somebody want to piggyback on that? I think that that is a crucial concept. No such thing as failure. As a coach, you're able to express and explain or paint or demonstrate for your students what that experience actually feels like when one is in it, when you're, you know, when, when, for example, I mean, bringing it back down to what Mark said initially in his introduction, I am a triathlete. Well, I was never a triathlete until a week ago when I successfully swam 800 meters straight away, never did it in open water in my life, but I was so well prepared mentally by my coach to keep on swimming. It didn't matter if I came in first, if I came in last, all that mattered was that I kept on swimming and went the distance. And when we can explain what that mental state feels like, that there's no such thing as failure, it is so empowering because that person is gonna step into the things that make them so afraid with courage. So that's that, awesome. No such thing as okay. failure is yeah, I, he is. Bill, if you allow spiritual concepts, everything is always in perfect order. And so when I talk about failure and what people perceive as failure, which is just a perception, right? It's just a mental concept we attach to an experience. When I can show them that everything is always in perfect order, there's an intelligence that runs through this uh, this world, this universe that we're part of. And when we can expand that, that scope, so we're not just in that one little set we lose, but it's like a bigger picture and everything is always in perfect order. And if you look through the rear view mirror, we can only connect the dots in the rear view mirror, you'll find that everything in your life is always in perfect order. It had to be that way for you to have that next experience. So when we can kind of broaden that lens then failure becomes something like, okay, there's something I can learn here, or I won, or, you know, it, it becomes a completely different picture that we look at. And really what we're doing on a performance basis, you know, we're getting people in a parasympathetic nervous system, which is your rest and relax. That's where you're in flow. That's where you're in the zone. And, you know, clearly in a competitive sport like tennis, we want to be in the zone. I mean, and there's techniques we can do even during a match where they can switch this. And so, you know, I've worked with this on CEOs, but it's very applicable in, in performance sports as well, because we, we need to get in that parasympathetic nervous system for anything great, grand, or beautiful, or inspirational to come through us. As soon as we're going fear, we're fucked. Excuse my French, but that's really where we are. We're not gonna be hit by inspiration. We're not gonna have willpower. All those systems shut down on a physiological level. Awesome. Okay, so we've got five minutes left. How do we put a bow on this? The, what I wanted to do was maybe go around the room and have everyone give a takeaway, but I doubt people's ability to be brief and answer in one sentence, So, which isn't a bad thing. But uh, how about if three people each try to answer in one, two, or three sentences, um, and we'll start with Vincent. We're going to put Vincent on the spot. What's What's your biggest takeaway or two in about three sentences? Well, the basic fundamentals is trust because it's reciprocal truth. You've got to have trust. Each person that's spoken has elaborated on some level of trust. And when you understand that <clears throat> that trust is reciprocal, 
where respect is not, then you have a basis for understanding, <clears throat> excuse me, of how the athlete, coach, parent can all work together. I have, I have one, and it goes back to what Margaret said, is that we, when we're presenting, we want maximum validity, relevancy, and, and consumability. We want to meet people where they're at. Yeah, well, what, what Robert told about failure is important for parents that kids never fail, you know? They have to keep trying all the time. So we think that, that they fail and, and that stress us as parents. So that's a good concept to, to share, yeah. So for me, I hope you've all enjoyed it. I hope you know that you're in the company of experts and authorities. There happens to be about another 55 of you. Over the next nine days, we are ramping it up. We'll be giving you ammunition and bullets for you to send on to your crowd, to get your crowd to come and watch you. The more people that do it, the more the algorithm picks up, the more the algorithm takes on. And for me, blessed and how lucky am I to be around you guys. Uh, it is a treat for me. Thank you, Mark. You guys were amazing. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Bill. Everybody, Thank you, uh, Mark. Yeah, appreciate it. Very good. All right. Nice to meet you all. Take care. Likewise. All right. So Likewise. it was a pleasure to be able to Thank uh, you, everyone. be with you guys and talking today. Goodbye. All right. no, Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Have a nice day.